Um, so you just won re-election. Yes. Uh, and uh, before that, it was obviously, as everyone I hope knows, the mayor of New Newark. Um, also, uh, kind of a superhero figure, <laughs> running, <laughs> running into burning buildings, uh, plowing the snow. Um, but you have actually, uh, more, on a more serious note, you've uh, talked about uh, the needs of policy to address diverse communities. And uh, as a person representing the first African American, uh, representing the state of New Jersey in the United Sta States Senate, uh, uh, United States Senate that is still lacking in a fair amount of diversity, um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit to us about the changing demographics in the country, the changing demographics in New Jersey, and how public policy has been a little bit farther behind those demographic changes. Well, well it, it's a, to me an exciting point in American history where this country that has thrived on diversity mm -hmm. uh, and had benefited from de demographic shifts as Irish and Italian, Polish, uh, Asian, so many different folks came in and really enriched this country. And now that continues, that process continues to make us now less and less uh, a, a majority white nation. And now there will be nobody that has a majority anymore. We'll have a, a workforce that is a majority minority coming soon. And so that really demands America to focus on the painful realities that we still have when you are not including everybody uh, mm -hmm. in your greatness. I, I've always said that you cannot have a thriving country if you're leaving large percentages of your population on the sidelines and not engaging them in the work uh, to, to grow, to, to thrive. And so, you know, I, was, I, I talked to uh, a big STEM conference in New Jersey and just the fact that we have women still left on the sidelines when only 10% of your STEM graduates going into STEM jobs are women. Mm -hmm. uh, you have minorities being left when only a quarter of your STEM graduates. That means you're leaving the genius and potential of so many uh, uh, children untapped. And so for me, the, the big comeuppance that this country has to have is dealing with these persistent uh, uh, discrepancies between who we say we are, liberty and justice for all, as the bishop just said, and what we're manifesting and understanding. And I think this is the important uh, intellectual as well as spiritual leap is that this is not about one group versus another. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not some kind of binary analysis that this group does bad, good and that group does worse. It's actually the, the enlightened understanding that in an interdependent society, we all do better when we all do better. And, and so addressing disparities in healthcare, education, the criminal justice system, um, this actually has to be a focus uh, for us as policy because this is the greatest natural resource in a global knowledge-based mm -hmm. economy. The, the greatest natural resource we have is the genius of all of our people. And America, therefore, in my opinion, has a advantage through its diversity that we're not fully capitalizing on. So uh, I should highlight that Cap did a book last year, uh, put forward, published a book uh, with Policy Link called All in Nation, which showed how the country is gonna become a majority people of color by 2043 but really looked into the economic impact of, of that issue, which is, you know, we obviously have racial disparities in all of these areas. And if we don't address those racial disparities as we move forward, we'll have lower economic growth, really just going to the point you're making. Right. Um, and if we do address those disparities, then we'll have higher economic growth. And so it's really in all of our interest to have policies that reduce those disparities. Are there particular issues you're hopeful about in addressing those disparities? Well, you know, the, the, uh, when I was mayor, I used to say all the time, in God we trust, um, I'm a person of faith, in God we trust, I would say, mm -hmm. but everybody else, bring me data. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're not a deity, uh, I'd <laughs> like to see the facts and the numbers. And, and How's and, that going in the Senate? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> next question. Um, <laughs> no, but no, seriously, so, if, People don't realize how expensive poverty is yeah. and how, how it actually is costing our country so much and that we are doing things in a backwards way. We would rather, instead of doing the, the low cost early interventions uh, to cultivate that genius of our full population, we're much more comfortable paying very expensive 
back-end uh, costs that are draining our, our national treasury at a time that money could be invested in growth. And so I still see this in healthcare when we see in many uh, communities upwards of 40% of women are not getting prenatal care or getting it mm -hmm. too late in a, in, a, in, a hospital, in a hospital room. When you're seeing just, uh, in fact, one of the greatest interventions just on an economic analysis that we could do to save government expenditures, which right and left they say they want to do, is, is something just called a nurse family partnership, right. is getting a, a, um, a, a, a nurse to come visit an at-risk pregnant woman in her th uh, second and third trimester through the second year, which could set a trajectory off for that kid that's dramatic. And the government dollars you save from visits to the emergency room, to my, one of my favorite, is between a 10 or 20 percent less likely that the child gets involved with the police, upwards of 50 percent that the less likely a mother is going to get involved with the police. And so when you have this clear data, I actually do have hope for public policy interventions. Everything from new ideas that are new, like uh, social impact bonds mm -hmm. and the ability to fund some of this through creative uh, financing means, it gets me really excited, all the way, and I've had this conversa direct conversation with friends of mine on the other side of the aisle, is like, hey, look, if you and I want to cut government, one of the best ways to do it is to make these strategic investments that we know are going to work. And by the way, we as government, we can actually not pay people unless they're showing us that their, that their performance is working. There's new creative means for with which us to do that. So I'm actually really hopeful. And, and what's making me hopeful is what I consider the incubators for democracy that are going on in this country, which is mostly being seen by innovative mayors mm -hmm. and some uh, innovative governors, and many of them are Republicans. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, one of the greatest things I'm seeing, I got all excited, I ran to the floor, uh, poor Mike Lee, uh, <laughs> and handed him uh, 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 stuff he probably already knew, but just how the Utah uh, uh, legislative and mm -hmm. uh, gubernatorial leadership are embracing criminal justice reform in mm -hmm. ways that should put uh, the federal government to shame to see this red state moving so quickly to do things that will lower government costs, lower prison populations. What we're seeing now for people that are doing that in other states like Mississippi and others, lowering crime rates and exalting human potential and productivity at the same time. And there's enough of those win-win-wins lining up that I think we have a very persuasive arguments on the progressive side mm -hmm. to stand before audiences like AEI, for example, a conference I'm hoping to go to this year. It's um, good you came to ours first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, <laughs> but to, to simply talk, not only appeal to Americans' sense of fairness, which I think pervades both sides, but also to the dollars and cents, uh, the compelling dollars and cents of a lot of this policy. So I'm going to I'm going to actually zero in a little bit on that because um, you uh, criminal justice is an area where you're seeing Republican and Democratic governors kind of take the lead. Kamala Harris was here talking about uh, about what she's doing in California. You have a bill with Senator Rand Paul and we're all for bringing people across the aisle to make progressive change. So could you you touched on it, obviously, but could you go into the specifics a little bit of your bill, the Redeem Act? Well, I, yes. But let me just let everybody know, I think one of the mo more shameful, if not most shameful, uh, truths about America right now is that we are a country that has this severely broken criminal justice system that is so out of the norm mm -hmm. for the globe, even for totalitarian uh, <laughs> oppressive countries, we are singular in the globe that we have uh, uh, four to five percent of the globe's population but 25% of the globe's prison population. And it's exploded so much since the 1970s that now there are more people in jail for nonviolent drug offenses today than all the people in jail uh, in the mid-1970s. And that this is not only shameful that the land of the free leads the, the, na the globe in incarceration, uh, but it's also shameful because of its profoundly disparate impact on poor and minorities. If, if, you, if you want to understand, uh, uh, having lived and worked in a, a, a majority minority city, majority black city, if, 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 and I've now have campaigned for Hagen, for uh, Landrew, for uh, uh, Pryor, I went to Alaska, I, used, I joked that I would find two black people up there, but um, <laughs> uh, in a packed gym, uh, uh, full of minorities, and you just touch upon this issue, 
you'll hear audible groans because people know that this is driving urban violence. When you trap a, a group of, a large groups of Americans in a basically, uh, as Michelle Alexander calls it, a caste system. In other words, if you are, if you are, if you grew up where I grew up, you experience a very different criminal justice system than uh, kids in uh, Camden, New Jersey. In fact, in college, um, I went to Stanford, like many college campuses, the use of marijuana is not seen something at, at, that you all ever be in the danger of being arrested for. But kids doing the same thing with, by the way, no difference between blacks and whites in usage or dealing of drugs, um, th th they face an entirely different criminal justice system, which in the blink of an eye, a small amount of marijuana caught in an urban place that now you are gonna face mandatory minimums upwards of five years or more and you take these plea deals, and now you have, you're a felon at the age of 17 or 18, you're, you're really now, as Michelle Alexander uh, writes in her book, New Jim Crow, living in a caste system that offers you very few options. And so people who decry urban violence, please imagine that when you strip everything away from a person, their ability to get a Pell Grant, food stamps, to visit their family even. To get another job ever. To get another job, but even to visit your family in public housing. Mm -hmm. Think about this, you can't even go visit your mom or your grandma. Uh, um, 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 the, the, the way we exclude these people, strip them, and, and, I, and I've done this with many people back when I was mayor, walking streets, stopping to talk to guys in the narcotics trade and getting their raw truth about why they're doing it. Because they don't wanna be on a street in February at two o'clock in the morning to make a drug sale. If you look at their hourly wage, this, this ain't a way to live. If you ask them what their life expectancy is gonna be, what they expect from their future, you'll hear things like dead in jail. It's, 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 it's a hopeless existence. Now we understand that why in Newark, it, Rutgers said that 84% of the murder victims 84% of the murder victims had been arrested before an average of 10 times. And so people get trapped in this, in this very, very uh, 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 punishing, uh, uh, shameful world in, in America if you have a felony drug conviction. And so for me, if you want to save government money, if you want to shrink the massively growing uh, 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 bureaucracy of our criminal justice system, which Holder in our first conversation Attorney General Holder told me, help me, help me, because our Bureau of Prisons is growing, squeezing out everything else in our budget. If you want to de deal with just basic human fairness, if you want to deal with helping to empower people to succeed as opposed to driving them away from being able to get a business license or a taxi license or all the things we, we, we heap upon drug, drug, uh, 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 drug felons, we, we, we have to change this system. And, and, and this is something well within the power, and as you said, there is a convergence. So Rand and I, was, it was in my first minutes elected as a United States Senator that he came over, I was talking about it so much that we said, let's figure out something to do together. And so now, as I look, uh, and again, this is a big cause of mine because while it may not poll in America's top 10 issues, um, it is the source mm -hmm. of so much uh, of, the, of the pain, of the economic injustice, of the educational injustice. Please understand that there's a problem in this country, so much so that Sesame Street now had, a, had pieces talking to this large population of children yeah. of incarcerated adults. And the impact it has, the trauma it has on a kid to have a, a, an adult incarcerated has effects that we don't even fully understand, but we're beginning to analyze the data on. And so th this is such an important issue to liberating the economic potential, saving government dollars, that, that it's something that I'm gonna be driving on. And the great thing about it is, yes, I have partners now that, you know, I, I just talked to Ted Cruz about this on the floor, uh, Flake about the, uh, this on the floor, Mike Lee, uh, Cornyn. There's a lot of people that I think uh, understand that we've got to catch up to red states in America and begin to move these massive reforms and, and deconstruct a drug war, which if you, if you want to have an honest conversation about race issues, which we're about to, we're about to get to another very intense conversation uh, um, mm -hmm. in these coming days with right. the Ferguson decision looming. And if you really want to look at it from a larger perspective of repression in this country, um, there, are, there are authors like Michelle Alexander that make a very understandable case that we, we are a country that had the sin of slavery that lasted until the uh, 20th century, 
uh, uh, and then the, the excuse me, the, 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 until the 19th century, uh, and then it ended and was quickly replaced by something called Jim Crow, which, which included vicious lynchings, attacks, um, uh, levels of brutality that we don't talk about in this country enough, telling that truth of, our, of what happened in this country. Uh, uh, and that ended around the time that I was born. Uh, um, and then it was quickly replaced by another system uh, called the drug war. Right. And that drug war has achieved something in our country, which is there are now more blacks in America under criminal supervision than all the slaves in 1850. And when it comes to Latinos in this country, it, 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 by the time a Latino male is in their mid-20s, tw uh, about 44% have a felony conviction, a criminal conviction. And then if you look at just poor people in general, that's, we all should be visiting our prisons, Th that's the folks that are there, including, on top of that, people that have legitimate mental health issues that aren't being addressed, mm -hmm. people that have, only about 20% of our uh, people that go to jail addicted to drugs or alcohol get the treatment they need. And, and so this is a system of great shame for our country that's driving continued racial disparities, discrimination, discriminatory uh, impact, um, that have states like mine have these peculiar realities where blacks are 13, 14%, but the prison population in New Jersey is over 60% black. Okay. And so for me, th this, has got a, this is a great bipartisan area where Republicans who now control the Senate can demonstrate, frankly, to African Americans, Latinos, and poor people that we are going to be a part of, of dealing with this sin in our country. That's fantastic. I actually want to uh, ask you a little bit about Ferguson, because I think that's, that's a great example of how um, you, we have seen kind of racially polarized discussion of the issue. You know, I mean, we've seen from the protests over the summer, there were a lot of politicians and perhaps more closer to one side of the aisle talking about the protesters in very kind of negative terms. How do you how do you look at what's happening in Ferguson, and how do you what do you say to political leaders of all stripes about how to address um, the anxieties, the real anxieties people have in the community there? Well, I'm I'm praying and hoping. I'm a prisoner of hope. I'm a pragmatist and a realist that know that this is going to be very difficult. But I'm praying and hoping that that when if there should be a, a conflagration in terms of emotional tumult and, and even violence. That, that all of us, whether you're right or left, stop and lead with love in our analysis, lead with love and understanding, and try to get, try not to be reactionary on either side, and just pause for a second. I, I went back and read a column I wrote in 1992, when it was my last year at Stanford, when the Rodney uh, King uh, okay. verdict That's came right. down. And the title of my article column, which now is online, uh, uh, don't those Thanks to the miracle of Google. And, and the Stanford <laughs> journalists, who the Stanford students quickly put it up there. Um, the title of the article was, Why Have I Lost Control? Mm -hmm. And it was this anger in me um, as a 22-year-old black man, knowing just, I basically was categorizing in my life all of these uh, experiences I had with department store security folks, with uh, police officers, uh, 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 and, and how much it, it made me, uh, at that time, so emotional. And so I guess I, I really hope that, that we have an honest conversation, whatever your political stripe is, that, that, that we can stop for a second and, and, and really begin, leading with love, begin to understand that we have to confront um, uh, the ugliness that still exists in our society, and that admitting that isn't in some way giving in to a liberal or uh, a democratic uh, reality, but it's giving, giving way to the space for us to address, which again, data clearly shows that the criminal justice system in America is, is dramatically biased in its impact against African Americans. If you know that um, that that eighteen year old at Stanford that, that might have been in possession of a lot of marijuana, just like the three last three presidents who admitted to doing this, one of them did not inhale um, but but hey you, now I'm, I'm sorry um, um, I'm sorry I'm <laughs> um, reporting that in buddy yes <laughs> but the last three presidents have admitted to doing this, 
but yet we have a group of people in America that are going to be almost four times more likely to be arrested, charged, by, thanks to mandatory minimums, and, and then have no way of ever uh, um, breaking out of that cast that they've been thrown into a felony uh, conviction for doing things that middle class uh, Americans, uh, college campus Americans, presidential track Americans uh, do with defiance and with no fear whatsoever. That is, a, that is a American problem, it's a criminal justice problem, and yes, there is a racially disparate reality there that we have to talk about. And I don't mean to get spiritual, but okay. strength okay. comes from Strength comes from, you know, in that wonderful uh, uh, poem, What Happens to a Dream Deferred, if you just try to cover something up, it will fester and blister and explode. And, and one of the best sort of uh, um, um, truths from the Muslim faith, uh, the, the Jewish faith, the Catholic faith, is the story of the Ark of the Covenant. And many people know the story that Moses came down, saw his people worshiping golden calf, got upset and broke the tablets but then he actually got two new tablets. Now the ark, which was the strength of, of the Jewish people that led them into battle, this tr people realized that they put both the broken tablets and the whole tablets in there. We are a country that has broken, painful, anguish-ridden history. That, that brokenness cannot be excluded. We have to speak truth to that as a country in a way that's not righteously, self-righteous or condemning or seeking to uh, uh, injure, but in an honesty and a loving way that helps us to heal and grow as a society. And if we can't bring up race in, in America today without creating immediate people falling into your camps, whatever you are, then we're not, we haven't matured at a point in our country that could ever help us to be, as Elijah would say, a light unto other countries of what a diverse democracy can be. And so there's got to be a healing, loving conversation with honesty in it, not defensiveness, not a, 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 a mean-spirited combativeness, but an honest conversation. Because when I walk streets in America, and there are people that have, have, there are people in communities, black and Latino folks in poor communities, that do not believe anymore that this country will give them a fair shot, mm -hmm. that they can play by the rules and do everything right, and that they have no hope. Hopelessness is a really toxic and dangerous state. And, and I'll finish with this. I was, um, I was uh, in the last few days of my election, I've decided uh, that I'm, I'm experimenting with a vegan plant-based lifestyle to the end of the year. This is a big <laughs> thing for me because I have this central relationship with these two men uh, named Ben and Jerry. And this is, um, <laughs> this is a very difficult thing for me, but I'm deciding to do a plant-based to the end of the year, see how I do, this is a big experiment for me. But, but I, I'm sitting there having one of my last, my last supper, basically. Um, and I went to that American uh, a height of culinary, all the foodies will get me here. I went to that American mecca of, of great cuisine, IHOP. And, um, <laughs> and I'm sitting there eating what is, talking about sin, like stuffed, French toast, pumpkin pancakes, hash browns, cheese eggs, like just, I'm just disgusting uh, 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 amount of calories I was ingesting. And the, the waitress was coming back and forth at the table and I started talking to her and uh, joking and laughing about, she's like, well, you have more people coming, don't you? No, I don't, this is just me, <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> and um, so long story short though, she lived in, um, in, a, in some projects in Newark that I know very, very well, mm -hmm. and have, had been struggling as mayor to make it even safe. Um, and uh, she was telling me that she was working two jobs. I asked her what her minimum wage is, and she was making the tipped wage, which you know yeah. is dramatically lower than what the minimum wage is, right. and uh, what many people think is the universal minimum wage. And I was asking her about her family. She's a single mom, three boys, which spoke to me because I know what it's like to raise black boys. And the, you look at the data, the, the, the perilous outcome for her children, the chances that they misstep in ways that when people in my town when I was growing up, they misstepped, and I yeah. saw kids like this, break laws, commit felonies, and nothing happened to them right. in the criminal justice system. And so she was telling me about how, trying to keep her boys at home. And when I say at home, not just in the housing complex, indoors because she was so concerned about the element that might 
pull her kids down. So she was saying, I'm working double shifts at IHOP, trying to make ends meet in a state, forget the poverty line in America, that's yeah. not New Jersey's poverty line, okay? Where she cannot make ends meet. Right. She just can't. So she's living in public housing, finding other ways to be above the poverty line, provide for her kids. And, and the, the thing that got me is that I, I love asking people, what's your dream? Like, what do you want to do? I've got my dream job. What's your dream? And when she told me basically in essence that she wanted to be a social worker, but that she couldn't afford to go to school right now, that she couldn't afford to try to provide for her kids, she couldn't find a job, that showed me that there's an American dream in her heart that this country right now is not giving her a chance to, to achieve. And that's not just one person in one city in America. That is large percentages of our population that believe when I work hard and play by the rules, that it's gonna be hard for my kids to do better than me. It's gonna be hard for me to achieve my dreams. And her dream wasn't to become rich, it was to help other people. And that has got to be the mission, not of Democrats, not of progressives. That has to be something that we all as Americans say is just not right. And we need to create a society that's not falling behind in these important measurable indices like social mobility. The ability for a woman like that, living below the poverty line or at the poverty line, for a woman like that to make it into the middle class. Canada's better than us, Germany's better than us, the classist society of England is better on that social mobility. And that to me is what America should be special about. And that's really where the fight has got to be for, for our future. Thank you so much. I can't think of a, a better encapsulation of the important work of opportunity for all than this discussion. Uh, we're falling a little bit behind, so I'm going to uh, turn it over to the rest of our session here. I want to thank you thank so you much, Sarah much. Booker, for your leadership, uh, for the work you have